Uh, I'm Anthony Edmonds. I'm the founder and managing director of Implemented Investment Solutions and also the online investment platform InvestNow. Uh, today, the topic is all about portfolios and investing in uncertain times and what sort of changes we're seeing uh, investors make to their portfolios. Uh, we've got an esteemed group of panellists here. We've got Chris, who's known to a lot of you, who's a principal of my fiduciary. Uh, also Helen from the medical assurance business, and Ainsley from Harbour, and Hugh Stevens from uh, the NZX Smart Shares business. So uh, our panel is going to take us through that and talk about themes and changes that we're seeing inside of invest investment portfolios in the investment industry, whether that be ESG, people responding to things like the changes in interest rates, inflationary environment. Not sure what the economist said in the session earlier on today. I think on one hand inflation's going to go up and on the other hand it's going to go down, which is pretty typical in terms of their world. But what does that mean in terms of what people are doing within their investment portfolios? Cool. So I think we kick into it. Helen gave me a pretty good directive in terms of health and safety. She said, if you see us leave the stage, we're heading for the bar. And so if we go early, just follow us. And so we'll get into it. I guess to get us started, let's start with you, Hugh. We've seen inflation. We've seen things like interest rates changing, but we've also seen you know, changes in asset classes that people can see uh, bring into portfolios. What sort of thing are we seeing out there uh, in terms of changes that people are making inside of the market and the things that they're investing into? Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thanks for this opportunity and, and the question, Anthony. So, look, really, uh, maybe I'll start with uh, talking about what people are doing on our platform and where they're moving their money, just as a, a kind of a real-world example. I think that uncertainty uh, that's coming through from those economic forecasts is really playing out into uncertainty uh, in the movements and switches within people's portfolios on our platform as well. Uh, so we're seeing uh, some of our investors moving more into uh, diversified funds. So we're seeing quite strong net cash flows moving from sector funds to diversified funds. Uh, we're also seeing people moving to cash. Um, but of course, um, many people realising that that's, that's putting them into a situation they're going backwards in real terms, I suppose, because of inflation. So uh, we are seeing movement to, fl uh, to cash. We're also seeing movements into, uh, into bonds again, and uh, maybe that's a reflection of the, I suppose, mark-to-market -market impact last year on New Zealand bonds particularly, uh, where they, they see some value there, maybe taking a little bit more duration. So the, the traditional asset classes, people are still moving and are still, um, I suppose, implementing their uh, macroeconomic thoughts into their portfolios that way. Um, but of course, we have an opportunity also to start thinking about alternative assets and um, certainly one of the, uh, I, I am involved in a restricted uh, KiwiSaver scheme that invests into forestry, private equity and also issues mortgages uh, and that's something they've been doing for more than 10 years and those three asset classes have been the, the biggest outperformers um, versus benchmark over the last um, quarter or, and even half. Uh, and it's an illustration of, uh, I suppose, the opportunities that, that exist um, out there for us to think a little bit more creatively about uh, what assets that we can put into the portfolios. I think the, the final point I'd make, though, is that that uh, reallocation towards that alternatives really needs to come with more sophistication and maturity in areas such as liquidity risk management uh, and our ability to stress test the portfolios. You know, that we have an uncertain world unprecedented, if I'm allowed to say that, uh, but, uh, but that means that we have some scenarios in mind, you know, where is this world going, what are the two or three scenarios that we can think of, and how does our portfolio look uh, if any of those scenarios play out. So we don't know what's happening with Europe, I suppose, um, we don't know what's going to happen with the, the energy war or the cyber war, information war. Um, but if one of these scenarios plays out, how, do we, how does our portfolio perform? So I think the, the work that the FMA is doing around uh, liquidity risk management and the, um, increasing the expectations on managed investment scheme managers in that area, um, and also their expectations around stress testing, I think is a good area for us to mature as an industry and, 
as investors to mature as well. Yeah, cool. Thanks, Hugh. Uh, reminded me, you know, you touched off on all those good points that reminded me we're in that whole period of uh, local body elections and things where people can cover off a lot of stuff in a couple of minutes. So um, we'll turn... Oh, yeah, perfect timekeeping too. Uh, how about you, Chris? I know you famously... Uh, I think you penned something recently about the death of 60-40 portfolios. I think that's probably unfair. You've probably misquoted it in the media. Um, what are you thinking in terms of what we're seeing in the clients that you're advising and helping construct portfolios? Um, well, no, I mean, what, what you read is always true, Anthony. So um, exactly. I, I would... Uh, I'd probably... There's a couple of things, I think, to just unpack there. Um, yeah, I certainly think... As a firm, we certainly believe that the 60-40 portfolio has been really challenged, and, and that's just come out in returns that people have experienced over the last 12 months. So if you look at um, uh, 2022 to year to date, you've got bonds down around about 10%, global bonds, bonds, New Zealand bonds down about 10%, equity markets down anywhere between 20 to, you know, 10 to 20%. Um, and this is the first time we've had a major seller for markets and you haven't had um, diversification really benefit you. And, and so, uh, wh and why is that? Well, let's, you know, if you look at the last 10 years or so, we've had a really fantastic run in our equity markets, but it's been aided in part by a very low interest rate environment. And what people are suddenly learning, and, and Hugh's interesting anecdotes about what people are doing on the platform, is that when you're investing into equities, um, it's got a tailwind when you've got very low interest rates. Uh, when interest rates start to go up, you find um, you know, a lot of those, other, those companies, the valuations start to get really challenged, um, and the market does react quite quickly to that news. And so if you've uh, invested into um, a global equity fund, if you've invested into growth oriented companies, and there's a lot of them out there now, if you think about the major companies around the world, um, you know, they're all large growth oriented businesses, you know, they, they've, um, uh, their businesses are really challenged in a higher interest rate environment and a slowing, uh, slowing economic environment as well. So moving to a diversified makes a lot of sense. Um, uh, but I think when you're looking at the diversified portfolios, just thinking about the exposures that you've got as well as also makes a lot of sense. So if you've just got a, a traditional portfolio, um, a balanced fund of you know, half and invested into equities, half invested into um, fixed interest, well, that has been challenged. So you really want to be looking at the mix of the, those asset classes, we believe. Um, you know, with, within fixed interest, you can do a number of different things. You can really reduce your duration exposure, um, the interest rate sensitivity of your portfolio, uh, and increase the cash allocation. Um, if you've got the... Um, the if, if you've got the willingness to, to, be, to move into more complicated portfolios and the understanding about different asset classes, you can also move into alternative asset classes. And again, Hugh mentioned, he actually did cover a lot, didn't he, in his few minutes mm. he spoke, and he mentioned that as well. Um, but there's some really interesting asset classes you can invest into that can play a really important role in a diversified portfolio, whether they be unlisted asset classes, such as private equity, forestry, mortgages can be really interesting as well, assuming there's, there's a good credit um, uh, you know, allocation there or credit risk within that portfolio. We've invested into um, uh, insurance and securities, trend following, uh, a little bit of gold as well in our portfolios just to provide that, that risk mitigation, that ballast, that negative correlation to, um, uh, to, to uh, certainly to equities. And, and I think they can play a really, really important role because when everything's correlated, you don't end up having a great, a great outcome. Yeah, no, interesting. Uh, and, yeah, and of course there's areas like currency as well. You know, New Zealand investors have been really affected by the fall and yeah. fall in the Kiwi dollar, right? Okay, currents, I mean, if you look at, uh, you know, you're know, exactly right. So when you look at um, market sell-offs, invariably um, there's a flight to safety that happens when, when there's a global market sell-off. Um, so what, it may, what that means is that everyone rushes to safe havens like the US dollar and they sell uh, Kiwi dollar, the Aussie dollar as well, so it tends to be sold off too. And what that means is that when you've got a lot of foreign assets that you hold uh, outside New Zealand, well, when you translate that back to New Zealand dollar, they're worth a lot more. So, uh, so it can be, provide a really nice diversification benefit as well, having, that, uh, having you know, uh, some unhedged currency exposure. The, the, the key thing to be wary of is that 
um, it can work the other way. And the Kiwi can move, you know, uh, can move up a long way too, so you just have to be careful about how you manage that. Um, but I'm sure Hugh can talk to that. Helen might be able to talk to that. Ainsley as well. Yeah. Now, Ainsley, any quick thoughts from you in terms of trends we're seeing? I, I agree with the other panellists that um, diversification remains key, and that's sort of like investing 101, right? So being in diversified asset classes is going to make a, a, a big difference. Um, yes, we saw bonds and equities both tank in the last, uh, last wee while, and that has been a horrible experience uh, for people, but bear in mind if you stay the course, stay invested, you don't crystallise those losses. And I think what we really need to be thinking of when markets are so challenging is overcoming those behavioural biases we have that uh, tend to make us think that the market's going to keep falling, um, so we want to get out on the way down, um, or uh, when the market's getting a bit frothy at the top, that it must keep going, so we'll keep piling in. And we saw a lot of hot money getting into the market in the equity markets late last year. What has happened since that time, of course, is that markets tend to be very forward-looking, particularly the equity market, and so they've re-rated to a point where they represent better value than they did this time last year. Um, similarly, it's not that long ago we were uh, all in a bit of a lather about how we were going to deal, how our banking system in New Zealand was going to deal with negative interest rates, um, and now we're worried about them going up. So in time, I guess the message is that diversification is really sensible, um, managing those behavioural biases, not crystallising losses uh, when they're there, but also not expecting markets to keep going in the same direction because ultimately they are cyclical, they remain cyclical. Um, just you know, diversify, set, make sure that you're aligned with your objectives and your risk tolerance on the way in, and then try not to look at it on a daily basis. That's what I would say. No, thanks. Cool. Thanks for that. And... So let's turn our minds now to like interest rates, inflation, um, you know, changes in the way the banking system works in terms of where banks are lending to now, where there's gaps in the market. What sort of things are we seeing uh, investors do in the face of that, Chris, in terms of their portfolio, constructing uh, fixed interest portfolios, but also wider sort of portfolio implications that we're seeing? Yeah, so if you look at um, you know, when you're looking at most portfolios, they've got a, a, a quite a high allocation to um, higher allocation to cash, but that's actually coming down. So a lot of fixed interest managers are now, you know, interest rates have moved up quickly. The um, uh, the expectation uh, for future interest rate increase is also being increasingly priced into. Uh, into, into performance numbers as well, into securities uh, valuations as well, I should say. And what that means is that you're starting to see people actually take on, um, uh, they can think about taking on some more duration exposure within their portfolios. So um, so it's, 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 a, it's been a really, really dynamic space uh, over the last 12 months or so when you've just seen how quickly interest rates have started to move up, even before they even started to move, the expectation of them moving uh, and the impact they had on, on valuations. But, um, uh, you know, I think it's, we can get really caught up with short-term performance movements. What, it, what does it mean for portfolios, though, is, uh, is that, you know, you, a lot of investors have looked at the returns of, of a balanced fund, a conservative fund, and they've found that they've had a, a, a negative outcome. And they've been surprised by that. As Ainsley said, that's typically, typically because of a mark-to-mark -mark market valuation, um, uh, where, you know, these securities are priced on a daily basis. Um, and if you did hold them uh, to their duration, you are going to, you know, get a positive return. You'll be getting that irregular income that you receive from those investments. So they're far from a bad investment. It just, uh, it just means that people need to be aware of the uh, intricacies of investing into fixed income, I think. Um, and you can do other things. You can invest into cash, as I said before. Um, there's other fixed income alternatives you can go down as well, as we mentioned before. But I think, in, in general, um, it's been a really, really interesting time for it to be a fixed income portfolio manager lately. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of product coming to market in this sort of alternative credit space as well, particularly in response to banks moving out of, you know, lending to some sectors of the market. Yeah. So that's interesting. Yeah, no, that's that's a really, really good point. So um, we're seeing private credit markets become very, very popular. Uh, so private credit funds become very, very popular, uh, certainly around the world, and, and, and we're seeing them pop up in New Zealand as well. Um, and these are, these are uh, typically funds where they're, uh, 
Um, they can go and either buy a, a credit book off the bank, um, uh, get a bunch of loans that they, that, um, uh, and package them into a fund. And, and, and what you're buying in there is, is credit quality. And so, and, and, you, and, and you're, uh, you're seeking to achieve a pretty solid running yield from that portfolio by taking on more credit risk. But you, you, know, you really need to understand the credit quality of those books. The liquidity as well is gonna be different. Typically it's gonna be less liquid. So if you suddenly need your money, um, you know, it's not gonna be easy to actually access, uh, access that money. Um, but they, they are playing a role as an alternative fixed interest allocation. And you're right, Anthony, the first driver was just very low interest rates and people looking to find something that can give them a high running yield. The second, second driver is banks looking to move out of that, um, out of that space um, and having alternative lend lenders come in and capture it as well. Yeah, and I know from talking to big global fixed interest managers, it's really challenging for them that there are now these big sectors of the market that they can't readily get exposure to. So that's behind that sort of theme. Ainsley, obviously, Harbour, big fixed interest manager. Thoughts from you in terms of this area? Well, yes, I, um, I'd, I'd back up what Chris was saying about the private credit markets. That certainly, um, you know, changes to banking regulations have um, opened the doorway for fund managers to go in and, and lend to reasonable credit quality because the bank's um, settings, prudential settings, have, have tightened up, um, which enables us to get a, a margin um, over what, you know, you would get from sovereign debt, which is what we tend to uh, put in the portfolio as ballast. Um, I guess the risk with fixed interest is the asymmetric return profile. On a good day, you get your money back at maturity. Um, it's not like equity where you have potential for growth. So I think it's, it pays to be very wary in fixed interest markets, and that is where professional management probably has a very, um, a very strong, sensible role to play in um, the ability to diversify, but also to get really into the nuts and bolts of the credit quality underneath. Yeah. And we've talked about volatile assets being things like the Kiwi dollar. Um, Jerry had a question about the role of cri um, cryptocurrencies in portfolios, so similar sort of themes. Anyone got a quick um, view or position on that in terms of where we're seeing it in the areas like KiwiSaver? <laughs> I, th I think, uh, well, look, if, if Chris is going to invest into gold, then surely he's going to have crypto in there as well, the same uh, kind of profile. Uh, yeah. Pressure, no, no, no. Um, um, thanks, Hugh. <laughs> the, um, oh gosh, crypto, look, I, I, um, I really have got no idea about the direction of cryptocurrencies, and I'd love to challenge anyone to tell me who does know uh, what, what, how it's going to perform on a forward looking basis. Um, what we do know is that volatility is incredibly high, like incredibly high. So it's not really an asset class. It just doesn't have the characteristics that you look into when you're investing into, into, into um, a sector of the market or an asset class. Um, the, uh, there's no doubt that things like blockchain, um, that uh, digitisation of, of currencies, um, uh, is, is here to stay and is a really welcome development and, and is really um, democratising how we can move money around uh, and, and, and really helping out, uh, you know, uh, I think a lot of individuals around the world about how they can actually um, uh, remove any barriers to, 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 to ch changing money and switching money, but um, I'm, I'm definitely not a believer in crypto. I think Hugh's, I think Hugh is, he's going to come on in. <laughs> come in strong. No, look, I, I, I mean, often in investment portfolios, we think about the economic exposure and we think about the market risk, but actually, usually we get tripped up by the uh, operating risk or some product um, aspect of the product structure. And uh, interesting to compare those two different asset classes. One, I suppose, Ainsley, the, the private credit market, it's something I've been involved in for a long time with my role at BNP Paribas before coming back to New Zealand. And uh, one of the things that really kicked off that uh, industry, I suppose, particularly in Europe, was the introduction of the AIFMD uh, regulations. So effectively, if you know about European funds and USITs, uh, there was an equivalent regime that came in for alternative uh, investment funds. And, uh, and what that did is introduce regulation around private credit, private um, equity, venture capital funds, uh, and really uh, allowed some of these new asset classes to be made available to uh, more mainstream investors. And so we're starting to see that flow out across the world. 
Uh, and you can see there that it's a much safer asset class, much more understood with more prescribed uh, reporting um, obligations. So you, you're comparing apples with apples when you look at a fund under AIFMD. So I think that's that's at one end of the extreme of the of the spectrum where we're seeing a new asset class actually being uh, presented through a robust um, product structure. Uh, and then at the other end, we have crypto coming on. And uh, I suppose we're just at the beginning of that journey. So, for example, in Europe, um, you know, the, 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 the global custodians won't touch the stuff until the European, uh, Europeans regulate it. Uh, global banks don't want to touch it until it's regulated. So um, you won't get tripped up necessarily by the volatility of the Bitcoin price. You'll get tripped up by someone stealing your coin out of a wallet somewhere. And um, because it's not in a in a, in a robust uh, global custody account, so I think you know, yes, economic exposure is important, um, but how it's presented to you in your portfolio is also important. And then you add on top of that the behavioural biases that uh, Ainsley was talking about, and uh, that that's <coughs> another layer. I I actually thought you were going to announce just then that you even do a crypto fund at NZX. No, you don't have to confirm yeah, that. And, just... Anthony was just advertising his fund there. I think the regulator <laughs> might be... Uh... Only quickly. But, I mean, we had a, a, the session on financial literacy just beforehand, but, you know, I've, there's no doubt that, and even the KiwiSaver providers that invested into uh, Bitcoin, I'm sure, and, and part of it is FOMO is so... Is so much pre present uh, in financial services, even amongst you know very sophisticated, smart investors, and this fear that you're missing out, this fear that you're not, um, you know, you're not uh, participating in a market that's going up in such a you know very dramatic fashion, it really does um, eat into you. And I think a lot of people really struggle with that when they go to have a conversation with a friend or a colleague or someone about what they're doing, and they're hearing the story about how they've done so well. But no one talks about their losses. Mm. <laughs> Everyone just talks about their gains. Yeah. So let's, Helen, let's get you into the discussion. You know, no conference in the current environment would be complete without getting into ESG and talking about those sort of areas. I guess an interesting thing, you bring us an interesting perspective because uh, Maz is obviously a mutual owned by your members, um, strong background in the health sector. Um, if we turn away from investments, how important do you think it is to think about the, uh, the people offering the funds themselves, so MAS itself, in terms of its approach to ESG type issues? Do you think that's something investors should think about? Uh, absolutely. It's a big deal at our place, as you pointed out, Anthony. We're, uh, I don't know if we're unique, but we wouldn't be far off it in the New Zealand market in that um, our customers are essentially, or most of them at least, medical professionals of some kind, many of them doctors. We were set up 100 years ago, in fact, by doctors, so and for doctors. So we, we have a bit of a unique position in terms of um, connection to our customers, and they become very loyal. Of course, we're also quite a broad company in that we're a general insurer as well as a life and, and disability insurer, and uh, we've got a two billion funds under management, KiwiSaver, um, and Master Trust business as well. So um, from a, from a um, connection perspective, I suppose, and from an, an ESG or responsible investment perspective, it's really important to them. Um, I think the climate thing is, is obviously important to them. They can see the impacts. They, they've got the shared experiences or the, the experiences that somebody was talking about this morning. Who was it? James Shaw. I thought the lived experience, I think that was a really great way of really helping us understand how that carbon or climate part has become so important to all of us. I suppose that's so real. But for our customers, actually a lot of it's about health, it's about the social stuff. And of course we've got a foundation, and I know we're not alone in that, um, but the Maz Foundation is um, quite well established. Um, we contribute a lot to it um, in many ways, not just financial, and that's all about health equity. So that's got much more of a social lens, um, and that uh, resonates so well with our, with our customers. So we did some research a while ago with Colma Brunton asking about um, so various uh, companies, so not just ourselves, but asking their customers, so what do you think are the, the biggest strengths out of the sort of laundry list of 15 things? And for Maz, it was our foundation. That was the thing that they thought was our biggest strength by, 
by quite a quite a fair margin. And then the other sort of top five, and they were quite strongly positive, were all about um, the way that we treat our customers. They feel that they, they're trusted, that, that sorry, that they can trust us, that we've got their best interests at heart, all that sort of thing, which again really talks to that sense that they get of the um, similar values, I suppose, that MAS have and, and these medical people have. So it goes well beyond just the investment approach that you're taking. You're saying that's a lot about who MAS is and how you sort of operate as a corporate citizen as well. Yeah, exactly. So, but I think if we were, if we have a responsible investment approach, um, it, like most people do these days, um, and I would say if we didn't, if we, mm. if we ignored that, I think that would not sit well with them at all. I mean, that, it's very much aligned with their values. Yeah, and for me that that's something I've reflected on a lot is as often as a sort of the approach to ESG is it driven from something organisations deeply believe, <coughs> or from an approach of like maximising return to actual manager themselves. So it's an interesting area I think that we'll mm. see a lot more of. It's really interesting you talked about foundations that we're seeing different organisations, established foundations, really up the game in terms of what they're doing as a corporate. Ainsley, obviously Harbour um, have been right into this area from day one. A couple of thoughts from you. I'm interested too about how we might be seeing ESG impact on things like asset allocation as well. You know, we see it at stock selection, but is there anything out there around how people are thinking about total portfolio construction? Absolutely. Um, the first thing is you're right, Harbour has been um, uh, running a, a very um, effective ESG process since inception 12, 13 years ago. In fact, the, the uh, founders of the business brought it with them from, a, um, from their previous... Um, from their previous role, so it's something that, that, that is really a strength. I think in um, financial services, the one thing that we cannot um, underestimate is the value of the trust that our uh, customers put in us in terms of handing over their money for us to look after it. Um, and it is something that is really hard won and easily lost. So. Uh, recently, for instance, we put together um, our inaugural sustainability report, um, and in that we talk about both how we uh, apply sustainability in an ESG lens to invest e companies, and that's both companies that we purchase equity in on behalf of our um, client funds and also those that we lend to, so we are incorporating this in our fixed interest portfolios as well. And then the, the, the balance of the report is on the things that Harbour itself is doing as a corporate citizen. And um, I have to say, it really, it, it, it's an impressive read, having um, been through a challenging couple of years, just to see what was possible in the last couple of years in terms of what we've been able to do um, in terms of helping the community. So yes, it is about um, being a good corporate citizen. It is about doing what you say you will do, and it is about walking the talk. So if we're going to go and ask the hard questions of companies we invest in, if we become shareholders of or we become lenders to, um, we need to be able to stand up to that scrutiny ourselves. Absolutely. Um, and I think that you know the, the wave of generation that's coming um, can have a fairly good bullshit detector, if I can use uh, the word in polite society, um, for what is really genuine and sincere and authentic um, behaviour and what is marketing fluff. Um, and really pleased to see the regulator taking a, a good hard look at this. Um, in terms of your question on asset allocation, yes, it's, um, yes, we look at it on a security, you know, company by company basis, but we also do, in terms of the overall asset allocation, look at how we can get um, allocations to private market assets into diversified portfolios. So whilst we're um, running managed investment schemes, we're a licensed MIS manager, um, and we are required to uh, unit price on a daily basis, we can have a sliver of exposure to venture capital, um, to private equity and so forth, because that's also where quite a lot of the impact is being made, and this is the, the sort of a fairly recent um, buzzword in, in responsible investing is rather than just talking about the exclusion end of the spectrum, so the things you don't put in the portfolio, where are the things you can make 
um, a positive difference by investing in, by providing capital to. Um, and a lot of that happens in, the, uh, in private markets, in venture capital and private equity space. And so how can we get a little slither of that into our diversified portfolios without putting um, our ability to unit price on a daily basis or fund liquidity um, at risk? And that is something that's it's, it's a challenge that we've solved. We've got a couple of diversified funds now that have, um, have a, a small allocation which is all you would want in, a, in a, a diversified portfolio to private assets. Right, to private assets, and you're saying that often you can have more impact than some, or, or think about the impact of different businesses. Absolutely, of absolutely. We have, um, uh, we have an impact fund that has uh, an allocation to venture capital and, and private equity, but also um, uses listed markets because there's no denying that the problem is far too big to be solved by private uh, private markets alone, we have to look at the listed market because that's where uh, the predominance of capital is and it's a very big problem we have to solve to save the planet and the people. Mm -hmm. And on that sort of note, but you know, as a bro more broad question, Chris, you know, is the investment community adapting fast enough to change in the new world that we're actually operating in? You know, are we embracing ESG or, or just being clever in the way we're approaching portfolio construction in a, in a modern world? Well, the, the investment industry is always quick to, to jump onto a new trend, Anthony. So, um, um, but, uh, but the, <laughs> that's a bit flippant. Uh, yeah, there's no doubt that ESG investing is, is, is here to stay. Um, and I think it's investing from a sustainable lens. And yeah, there's a lot, lot we could talk about here. Um, I think when you're looking at um, the products that have come out into the markets, we start off with just exclusion-based exclusion products with our... Um, uh, exclude, you know, tobacco, um, nuclear weapons, uh, and the like, and, and and now we're seeing more of a focus around uh, a carbon footprint as well. So, what's the coal, what's the um, uh, the um, fossil fuel exposure of, of the portfolio? Um, uh, also, you know, more and more uh, fund managers and create. In fact, you know, really, fund managers, yeah, pretty much all fund managers now certainly active fund managers will tell you that they're also investing, uh, taking into account ESG considerations as well, so environmental, social and governance factors. They might um, uh, buy that research from a global uh, ESG research provider, they might do it in-house. But, but invariably everyone's doing it now in some way, shape or form. And the reason that they're doing it is because it's the right thing to do. It just makes sense when you're investing into a company, you want to, um, you know, you're looking at the valuation of the company, whether or not they're a good company to invest into from a returns-based perspective, but also just making sure for environmental, social and governance factors as well, or tick the box. Um, so, so I think you know, the, the funds management industry has been very quick to bring out funds and bring out products. There's a few things that I just uh, would note about that. First of all, um, you know, there's some biases that are coming into, into investors' portfolios as a result of these changes. So if you look at the Vanguard Ethically Conscious International Shares Fund, um, uh, you know, that product um, uh, is, has a pretty clear exclusion around fossil fuels and, and almost zero within, into energy uh, related exposures. Uh, very little also in basic materials. And as a result, it's skewing uh, the portfolio to the larger companies around the world, which tend to be technology related companies and healthcare related companies. And as a result, you're getting more of a growth bias in your portfolio. So those funds uh, had, a, had, a, had a really strong run up in 2019, 2021, but they've been the worst performing funds over this year. Um, so just bearing that, that in mind, it's, it's, it's not a bad thing, uh, it's just the fact that you, know, you are getting more of a growth bias through your, your portfolios as a result of, of some of these structures that you have in place. And, and that, that's most KiwiSaver funds now, because many, um, you know, if they're following a, a either a passive-based uh, approach, they're certainly adopting those um, more stronger uh, returns-based, uh, sorry, um, ethical um, uh, considerations that are coming through around negative screens. The other point I'd make is that um, uh, carbon's a really big focus now as well. So in thinking about the carbon footprint of a portfolio, thinking about scope one, scope two emissions of the underlying companies you're investing into, um, thinking about um, net, net carbon neutral by 2050, which is a big focus for, is it 2030? 2030, 2050, I forget. Yeah. It's soon, but not that soon. 
Um, it's, be, it's a really big focus at the moment for a lot of investors. So when you're talking about sustainability, it's, it's most of the focus seems to be now about um, thinking about your exposure um, from a um, uh, from a carbon footprint perspective. Yeah, and I, I think we, I certainly remember looking closely at that Vanguard fund because I think at one stage it retained something like 16% versus the mainstream index did eight. Exactly. And so when you're sitting there looking at that sort of unintended tracking error, you've got to stop and take a breath. Now, a lot of people were, were looking at that and going, yay, look at the impact of you know, ESG, SRI, but I guess we were looking at it going, yeah, that's cool, but wow, that tracking error thing was really amazing. It was amazing. I mean, we were saying, you know, Blind Betty got that performance. It wasn't necessarily skill. I mean, there was some index instruction that led to it, but it was it yep. was as a result of just the skews because of the process. Yeah. And Hugh, you want to jump in? So maybe just one point first that, uh, you know, Chris was mentioning that maybe this is an active management story, but actually, you know, really the, the index industry has really come up with um, many, many solutions here. There's uh, order, an order of magnitude or more and more indices than there are listed global stocks now. So um, there is, uh, you know, there is an ability to put together a portfolio that does, uh, I suppose, uh, remove those um, tilts and uh, it is possible through... Um, just, I suppose, good uh, um, product selection to actually get the right um, factor and sector exposure that you need. So uh, there is an index tracking solution to this portfolio in implementation as well as uh, active management. Uh, I, I would say, you know, from a SmartShares perspective, uh, we have, um, I suppose, approached this as a portfolio manufacturer and, as you can imagine, other companies like BlackRock and Vanguard as well um, are providing product across the entire market, so um, you know, we need to provide exposure to the to the entire New Zealand share market, the uh, to the U.S. markets, uh, and and to other markets. And I suppose uh, ESG is you know is 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 uh, presents a problem, I suppose, because what do we do uh, in a, in a world where people do want to take a view on some of these. Uh, environmental, social and governance factors, but also make available um, the market index. So uh, you know, what we're really saying in those cases is that we provide investors with the ability to take the full market exposure, but we also have uh, core screened products, um, which then take out uh, the, um, I suppose, those um, ESG factors or, or that uh, we don't, uh, that our investors don't want in the portfolio. So we sort of take that two level approach. Um, I think, you know, there was a speaker this morning that made the comment that we can't divest our way to net zero. Uh, that's not going to work. The, the companies that need to invest to uh, remove emissions, uh, they need capital to do that. And so, you know, Ainsley's point that, that I suppose we need impact funds, we need investors, we need investors' capital to go and be directed into uh, 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 investment. Um, and so, you know, this is where... Uh, all of us in the market need to you know, create uh, the business case, really, for more of these impact funds to be uh, created in the New Zealand market. And so, you, so you're saying just straight exclusions might not be a perfect answer? Yeah, I love that quote. We can't divest ourselves mm. and, you know, no, to net zero. So you know, when we see someone taking a, a simplistic approach... Uh, you know, to to this by saying, look, I'm I'm ESG compliant because I've divested everything that's nasty. You know, that that's uh, that reminds me of the Mencken quote, which is uh, for every complex problem, there's a solution that's clear, simple, and wrong. <laughs> yeah, and and I think earlier on here you touched on almost one of the true bits of comedy in the current investment world, which is the rise and rise of all the different index funds and indexes themselves. And there's all these people saying, oh, I don't believe in active management, but I actively allocate and manage portfolios of these like ETF and index funds because there's more of them than stocks. And so you see a lot of people actively managing index funds while saying they don't believe in active fund. Active management's a pretty... A active human. asset allocation as opposed to stock selection. Yeah. But yeah. on that, isn't the uh, SEC looking at whether they actually need a licence to give advice? those index providers now because they are effectively by excluding some stuff giving advice which was not what they set out to do but an unintended consequence of, of putting screens through 
Um, on the carbon footprinting, that's something that um, more and more of our institutional clients are, are looking at and in terms of giving us um, mandate conditions um, that require us to actually help them towards um, targets that they've set for themselves towards um, net zero and so forth. So, you know, we are having to um, allocate to stocks with lower emission profiles. Um, but it's very important that we also do, as you say, Hugh, support those companies that are on a journey to um, renewable resources or um, renewable energy. Um, they do need capital to do that. They can't do it without, without money. So we look, for the, we look for those companies that have definitely got a plan um, and are genuinely committed to, uh, to executing and, and fund them accordingly. Yeah. And just changing directions again slightly in terms of, um, you know, these have been uncertain times. Uh, I know Haiti asked a question whether or not um, we need to have a more proactive approach, basically, to communication and engagement with investors in times like these. Thoughts on that, where people are seeing that happen or people are doing it well? Yeah. Um, well, from our perspective, um, more is generally better in terms of communication. Cust customers value it when you reach out and talk to them. Um, and during volatility, times of volatility, I think perhaps even more so. So, and uh, you know, that, that's not a mass thing. I think there are many, many examples of fund managers who are, and providers who are doing a great job at reaching out to their customers during this time and trying to do exactly what Ainsley was saying before, which is get around that human desire to you know, get out when the going gets a little bit tough and crystallise the losses. Mm. I, yeah, I mean, I was going to give Dev a shout out, but I see he's left, so I don't know what I said that offended him. But he, uh, but you know, this is the kind of, uh, and and if he is still there, congratulations for your win this morning. But um, look, I, I think you know the platforms, the self-directed platforms, um, you know, Invest Now and and Sharesies and now um, Sugar Wallet and others. Uh, you know, one of the one of the ways that they can actually help in this situation is creating these regular investment plans where actually it completely strips out the behavioural bias and strips out even to some extent the need for advice because uh, if they're in there uh, investing dollar cost averaging over time then they're actually doing better during the the, the, the downturns because they're investing when the markets are low. And uh, I suppose I sometimes wonder with this question uh, about financial education, whether in some cases it's actually the product and, and the service that is flawed, not the uh, financial understanding of the investor. That you know, if you're a driver and you have to understand you know, the, the, the diameter of the pistons in your engine, then you know something's wrong with the solution, right? Not with the driver. Uh, so you know what's wrong with our products that actually you have to have um, advice when the markets get wobbly. The markets always get wobbly. So you know where are we going wrong that actually you need uh, advanced training um, to be able to invest through a, a downturn. So I think you know there's a bit of a challenge for all of us that actually what are what are the services that we're providing? Are they fit for purpose through all of the business cycle? And some of these, these regular programs where people are just putting money in the whole time regularly, maybe that's a better solution. Yeah, cool. And I suppose a big question for me, you know, if we go forward 10 years from now and look back to now, if we think about, you know, diversified, balanced, standard KiwiSaver funds, what do we like to see that's changed? You know, if I think about the last 10 years, you know, if I was slightly critical, not too much has changed in terms of portfolio construction, what we're seeing people do in uh, their portfolios. So what do you think we'll see if we look backwards? Chris, how about, how about you? That must be the sort of thing as a consultant you spend all day thinking about, so you'll have a really thrilling answer in all, terms all of All day, all night, my weekends. Um, oh, you know, so, yeah, so what's my wish list? Uh, I would like to see a little bit more fragmentation in terms of the, the at the top, in terms of, you know, it's just dominated by um, the top five providers or thereabouts and, um, uh, you know, so 
less consolidation that we've seen and more competition. This is really, it's because it's really healthy. It's really healthy having, um, you know, having uh, the tension between some of the bigger providers. Um, it means people are really testing themselves, making sure they've got the right products. Um, the fee tension comes into play and the like as well. And I just don't think we've got enough for that at, at the moment in KiwiSaver, if I'm honest. Um, I'd love to see, love to see uh, KiwiSaver uh, schemes come together, maybe with NZ Super ACC, other big investors, and do some really big private investments as well into our infrastructure in New Zealand. Like some really cool initiatives that you can get a good return from it. It does, uh, it really helps our country's capital markets as well. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're top of my, my wish list. Yeah, cool. Helen, any thoughts from you in terms of that? You, you, you don't want to see the top KiwiSaver providers lose their market share, do you, Helen? <laughs> I, I think a, yeah, a nice equal share of <laughs> funds under management would be amazing from our perspective. Um, but yeah, I do take your point. I mean, there's some very, very, very large providers out there, and there's definitely um, going to be continued focus on fees. Um, 100%, I think that, that that's true for all of us. So, um, and, I, and I welcome that, um, because the industry, if you look at Australian super, for example, that very quickly became a massive industry, didn't it? So contribution rates, uh, sadly, are still languishing a bit in New Zealand compared to Australia, but nonetheless, the, you know, the total amount invested is growing, which is fantastic. So it is going to create opportunities for us to do some, perhaps some slightly different and a bit more... I don't know, innovative things. I think I, I'm really interested in Chris's view about joining together with some of those government agencies, ACC and the Super Fund, and seeing if there are some um, cool things that we could invest in for sure. Yeah, yeah. cool. Ainsley? I'd like to see the, um, uh, the industry really turn its attention to solving for the gender retirement gap, because uh, that's a, a real concern. So the um, the impact of women spending time out of the workforce means that they end up in retirement with a lot less money and then they live longer, which is not an ideal outcome. So um, it would be great if the industry would spend a bit of time thinking about that. Um, it would be great if the industry... And when Harvest's not a KiwiSaver provider, so I don't have a lot of influence over, over these aspects, but it would also be great if there was... Um, some more attention paid to the decumulation phase post KiwiSaver because uh, some way of making sure the nest egg stays intact whilst the income uh, gets spent and endures for what is a longer and longer life expectancy um, is a problem uh, looking for a solution, I think, and, and we're not alone in, in that. Um, I do think um, 10 years from now that um, ESG or whatever it's called by then or whatever it's known as, be quite good if we could actually agree on a name for it, um, will be embedded in all um, managed funds. It won't just be um, it won't it won't just be the majority. It'll be all of them by 10 years from now. So um, no more bad badly behaved companies. That would be great. Yeah, you do ask in a gender sense what it is that we do as an industry that discourages women particularly from getting into the industry, but really uh, interesting to come to a conference. You know, it's been a long time since I've been to a conference, but seeing Maritim and Pacific type issues suddenly being discussed in these forums is really, um, really empowering and really enlightening as well. So um, let's, let's cheer that on and hopefully we see more of that into the future. Hugh? I'd like to see uh, full participation in retirement savings. Uh, so yes, the gender pension gap is important and there's some other pockets of uh, lower participation that I think we can really have an impact in. Uh, secondly, I'd like to see contributions up at a, you know, at least double where they are now and you know, really making a realistic uh, difference to people's uh, lifestyle and retirement and during their life. Uh, and then thirdly, I'd like to see the capital being applied to drive a really vibrant capital market in New Zealand uh, in you know, infrastructure, social infrastructure, physical infrastructure, uh, but uh, really you know, to the point where we can uh, really um, see public and uh, private funding of, um, of our future. Yeah, and one of the points you raised there I think is really interesting for the industry here around participation rates in KiwiSaver. I think, who did I see? I think it was David Chaplin published an article today in Business Desk, and he was highlighting that a really t uh, that the people in default, I forget what the number was, sorry David if you're here, 
David. I think it was about 20% of people are in default, but they're only holding about 9% of assets, right? 12.5% so of the people who are in the sorry, 12.5% of everyone in KiwiSaver is in default and they have 3.5% of the total asset base of KiwiSaver and this is a real game of you know, people's earnings and things and look to be a really ruthless provider when KiwiSaver came to market, the person in our team who had a PhD when we all sat there saying, oh why with us if only the industry got compulsion, he highlighted that nearly the whole of the country's wage base would join KiwiSaver because it was the 50% of people who earned most of uh, wages. And he was saying the argument for compulsion is so people don't miss out in these minority groups, lower earning groups. And that certainly struck a chord with me at the time as a really valid argument for looking at least where people can become members that we should be focused on that because it's just going to be a tragedy in 30 years time when we've got people who have missed out just through almost like social circumstance of where they've grown up and how they live and I think that's something that is a real political conversation so I think that's a really good point Hugh that you make there. At, at, least, at least the default funds are not conservative anymore so you know yep. Thank God, <laughs> honestly, because that was, um, I just think that that was, you know, people, the unengaged who invest into KiwiSaver, who, um, and, and, and they don't have to be poor, but obviously a lot of them are on uh, lower incomes, uh, you know, they do need to be nudged to take on uh, a little bit more risk to get a higher return and things like that, and I think, um, you know, that's, that's a good outcome there. Mm. And, and taking into account the, the topic of the panel, I suppose it's, it's worth just a quick comment on our default fund asset allocation because uh, it's done reasonably well through the first uh, seven months. And, um, Pure luck, Hugh. Not, not, just... and, uh, <laughs> but yeah, one, one aspect of it that I think is quite useful and, you know, to talk about is, is the, the, the playoff between uh, currency hedging on the international equities and... Um, uh, and um, and yeah, so, so the fact is that, that our fund had uh, no, for the first six months, no hedging on international equities. And the idea being that, of course, the, that there was some partial natural hedge between uh, the US equity market and, and the New Zealand dollar versus the US. And that actually played out uh, for us uh, as the New Zealand dollar dropped. Um, and uh, it also reduced the costs. Uh, of that portfolio, so it was a very cost-effective way of providing some natural hedging in the portfolio. So, um, just an so interesting. It's also the cheapest KiwiSaver fund. Isn't it? It's the cheapest KiwiSaver fund, isn't it? But I, I will say, at least you, at least, at, not least, but you were willing to be different. You knew you were going to be different, and that's that's what we're we're looking for because there's no one way to invest. And having differentiated views is, is really healthy. The other, the other differentiated view in that portfolio, see we're in a portfolio <laughs> construction uh, panel, was that there are no international uh, fixed interest securities in the portfolio. So it's just New Zealand bonds. And again, once you've hedged your international back to New Zealand dollars, you're effectively getting the same exposure. So if you Yeah, except you've got exposure to a very limited... Yeah. You know, if you went to the ANZ Bank and found that the bank had all of their assets in 32 loans or 40 loans, you'd be sitting there staring at the guy, at the woman running the ANZ Bank, saying, "Well, uh, and the, and this why? is the advantage. This, oh, I've lost. The, yeah, and and look, I think that is uh, comes back to the point earlier that Chris was making that you know, uh, I suppose starting to see." Um, the spread of fund, you know, funds under management uh, moving away from the large uh, Australian banks to the smaller providers such as uh, SmartShares SuperLife means that we can <laughs> do some of these things because we're smaller scale and I think that's a, a lifelong story about asset management that as you get larger it's harder to, um, to, to move into those areas of higher value. So, um, yeah, another portfolio allocation story from, the, from thank you. Anthony. I'll remind you of that when you grow massively, Hugh, which you will do in terms of running the smart shares business. We'll revisit that, that, that topic at some stage. Look, there's lots of interesting areas that we could get into, but I'm just mindful of the 
goal that Helen set us at the outset before we came on stage of getting to the bar slightly early. So, uh, questions, any final questions you want to send to the moderator? I've asked all of the questions as they come through. Oh, I think that looks like a journalist, it is. Yeah, yep. It's, um, Might need to repeat the question, Chris. Uh, the question is, what is trend following? Uh, is it uh, about the latest trends in music or fashion? Um, so trend following is, is uh, it's a, a form of investing where you basically uh, buy the winners. So you, um, you look at uh, trends of, of security prices and you can invest into uh, um, equity markets, you can invest into currency markets, you can invest into commodities, very liquid markets. And if a market is showing you that it's moving in a certain direction, uh, then you uh, can follow that direction. You can go 100% long, 100% short. Uh, trend following's been around, there's a lot, of, a lot of academic research around trend following, it's been around for many, many decades, uh, and uh, what we actually know through behavioural finance is that um, companies, when they're performing well, they tend to continue to perform well, and so uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a, a strategy that can work really, really well uh, when markets are moving one way, up or down. So it's worked really, really well this year because it's been a long energy, short uh, fixed interest, short equity markets. Um, and it provides a negative correlation to equities. Now, it doesn't work very well when you have periods of inflection, when markets suddenly move um, uh, from being you know, negative to positive. Um, and so you can actually have these periods where, where it can underperform um, for periods of time. You can also, um, not getting too specific, but you can have volatility adjusted strategies as well, so you can t look at how much risk you want to be taking on. Um, some of these funds can, can have very high levels of volatility and very high returns as a result, but also very large negative returns too. But it's a really interesting strategy. Cool. Okay, well, I think, you know, we've covered a lot of ground, whether it be ESG, the impact of inflation, um, trend following uh, that we've just talked about, through to Hughes Fund, we had an advert for that, I think, somewhere inside there, Hughes. So good, we touched on that. Um, so I'll draw the session to a close. It's certainly an interesting area. There's lots of areas to debate and think about. You know, we could have had a whole hour, I think, of just talking about currency hedging and diversified funds. I still think that's a really fascinating area that people should stop at some stage and think about, but we'll do that for it. If we get invited back, we might do that. And so we'll draw it to a close, but thanks for everyone for participating uh, and coming along to the session. And Helen will be with me at the bar at some stage, so we look forward to it.